Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture. Again, uh, we will continue our discussion on strengthening mechanisms. In the last class, uh, we stopped with uh, you know particle hardening. Uh, even in particle hardening, we looked at uh, uh, some of the aspects like coherency hardening, okay, chemical hardening, okay, and then uh, you know surface energy contributions from chemical hardening, etc., etc. In that uh, aspect, we also uh, looked at uh, the idea of you know the similar hardening mechanisms involving surface energy is another uh, two mechanisms uh, namely stacking fault uh, energy as well as order uh, hardening these two concepts uh, are all similar to uh, surface energy uh, hardening or chemical hardening so the physics of this uh, surface energy sorry the stacking fault uh, energy and uh, order hardening uh, they are all similar so we will look at uh, order hardening uh, much more uh, closely so what we are uh, seeing here is uh, the particle um, which is uh, an energy dislocation is approaching this particle and uh, this particle is a precipitate and this is a matrix and uh, this is not a, a simple precipitate this is a a particle of ordered precipitate okay the particle crystal structure is cubic and its composition is ab so that means you are going to have uh, ab 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 atom in a single plane and then the subsequent planes are going to be like this that means uh, the surrounding of the a and b will be similar so b is surrounded by a and a is surrounded by b it's something like that. So, if the edge dislocation, if it enters the particle, then what happens to this, uh, the atomic uh, arrangement is the question. Okay. So, what is happening here? We are seeing that the moment the edge dislocation cuts through and enters this particle, the the bond which is already there, original bonds AB, AB will become BB and AA and BB and AA. So this is going to create a, a new interface, something like this. And then the moment the dislocation exit the particle, then the whole interface is going to become AA, BB, AA, BB kind of a bonds. So what is special about this? So the slip in the particle is accompanied by the formation of anti-phase boundary. That is so the, the, the boundary which we are now looking at is called anti-phase boundary which consists of AA and BB bonds across the slip plane. Why it is important? So after the dislocation exists the particle, the antiphase boundary occupies the whole of the slip plane area of the particle. The associated energy increase is about pi r square. That is antiphase boundary energy. This is important because this, the energy of the system is raised. So this interface will have a higher energy. So that is why it is of important to discuss. The increase in energy is roughly linear with the dislocation position in the particle. The simplified analysis predicts that the increased shear stress due to order hardening is given by tau ordering is equal to pi into APB times F divided by 2V. So this is a simple analysis for the order hardening okay and uh, this is not the uh, i mean the simple analysis is not going to not just going to help us in a great way because this assumption whatever we have just looked at uh, edge dislocation a straight edge dislocation entering into the ordered precipitate and then it forms an antiphase 
and it does not con consider the second dislocation which can enter this particle. Okay. Suppose if you imagine a second dislocation of similar kind enters this particle and then moves away, then what happens? Then the, the original lattice will get restored. So if you, if you recall, what will happen to the lattice when a edge dislocation cut through in our dislocation lecture, if you recall, in fact, I put some schematic where uh, a letter A was, you know, drawn and then we made that uh, edge dislocation to cut through that lattice, which is containing the letter A and then you see that the complete displacement happens, right? Though the, the lattice uh, will restore its original configuration, but every atom will find its new neighbor. Okay, so that is the passage of one edge dislocation will result in. So here we are now talking about a second dislocation because the first dislocation, edge dislocation, has created an antiphase boundary. If the second dislocation comes in a way, then this antiphase boundary will be eliminated and the ordered crystal will be restored. But the question here is, suppose uh, what we have learned from the dislocation theory, the dislocation theory says that if the two edge dislocation of the similar sign, what will happen? They are going to ripple each other, right? So when the, when the two edge dislocations are going to ripple each other, then these two dislocation, you know, they'll try to keep the independent dislocation far away, depending upon the energy consideration, right? If the dislocation repulsion is high enough, then it will be, uh, the dislocation will be well separated. But still you can just uh, analyze, uh, you know, one dislocation cutting through this particle and then look at the energy, how it changes. But that is not going to be the case. Suppose if you think that the two dislocations, you know, the, the antiphase boundary energy is uh, low or high, depending upon that, the these two dislocation can come or cut through the particle together or travel together. That is going to be decided by the antiphase uh, boundary energy. Okay, we are going to just look at the details in a minute. But before that, if you assume that the D, these two dislocations are going to travel together, then that configuration is called super dislocation because the Burgers vector is going to be not the uh, having uh, the normal magnitude, it is going to be double. Okay, so it is that is why it is called super dislocation. So for a normal circumstances, if you take, uh, you know, one by two, one, 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 like, you know, it's a lattice translation vector in a VCC, for example, I'm saying, in ordered crystal, they are not going to be the lattice, no longer going to be the lattice translation vector, but it will be a complete a full, okay. Uh, two times the normal Burgess vector. So that is why it is called super dislocation. Okay, this is one idea you have to remember. Okay. So now the separation distance of the two dislocation depends upon the ratio of antiphase boundary energy to GB. Okay. This is the ratio of two forces. One antiphase boundary energy is a force that binds the dislocation while the other GB represents the force that separates them. So depending upon the ratio, the separation of these two dislocation will be decided. When the ratio is low, the dislocation travel separately. When it is high, they will travel in pairs. We define a ratio epsilon order to characterize the order hardening that is epsilon ordering is equal to AP BE divided by GB. So this is very important. So look at these two schematics. One case we are, we are showing that uh, the particles are just dispersed in the matrix and uh, the one dislocation line goes and then the other dislocation line which is straight which follows. So you can also now recognize the, the contours of this line. This particular dislocation line try to bend okay, around this particle, but the second one is 
going straight. So you know the meaning of this now. So when you say the dislocation line is going to bend around the particles, then that means it is going to form a loop around this. That means the particles are harder. This is what we have seen yesterday in the last lecture, right? But when the dislocation line is remaining straight and then it just travels, that means the, the particles are weaker. So that is also another idea. Just I'm trying to recall, but that is not important here. We will just see in the context of the ratio of APBE versus uh, APBE to GB. That ratio we will just discuss. On the other hand, this particular image shows that uh, the both the dislocation travel together, mostly trying to bow against the particles. So this is the view looking down on the slip plane for the situation corresponding to a low APBE or equivalently low epsilon ordering. So when the APB energy is low, these two dislocations are going to get separated and then they are going to travel together. And, and the situation B, high anti-phase boundary energy or high epsilon ordering, then they will move as a pair. The distance will not be separated as shown here, this, this schematic. So when the anti-phase boundary energy is low, the dislocations are widely separated. The leading dislocation line shape corresponds to that of a hard obstacle situation and uh, the effective obstacle spacing is the mean center to center spacing of the obstacles on the slip plane. So this also we have just uh, illustrated clearly in the previous lecture. When these particles are considered to be hard, then the, the obstacle spacing is center to center okay, of uh, each uh, individual obstacles, that is L1 here. The trailing dislocation is straight corresponding to a weak obstacle situation for which the effective obstacle spacing is much greater. So the effective uh, spacing comes like L prime we have seen in the previous lecture. Here it is referred as L2, which is okay much greater than the L1. When the APB is high, the second dislocation closely trails the leading dislocation which bends significantly during the passage through the particle. So this is going to happen. So that means when these two dislocations are going to move as a pair, obviously there will not be any anti-phase boundary. That you have to remember. Okay. So more detailed considerations uh, lead to the following expression for the increase in the shear stress due to the order hardening in the early stages of precipitation and the situation when the dislocations are widely separated. That means low APBE or equivalently low epsilon order. So for this situation, there is uh, a semi-quantitative expression is developed and this is uh, uh, given in this form. So tau order almost equal to 0 0.7 G times epsilon order to the power 3 by 2, fr by b to the power half. When the dislocations are not widely separated, the increase in strength is less and it is given by tau ordering is approximately equal to 0 0.7 g times epsilon order to the power 3 by 2 times fr by b to the power half minus 0 0.7 epsilon ordering times f where the epsilon order is high and this is again valid for early stages of precipitation. So we have to remember all these expressions are derived when or it is assumed when the precipitation happens or the precipitation size is considered at the early stage. That means it is not coarsened enough. That is what you have to remember. As with the other particle strengthening mechanisms discussed, the dislocation shape assumed during the particle shearing is different in the early stage and late stages of precipitation. This alters the extent of hardening 
for order hardening the equations analogous to the previous equations which hold for the late stage of precipitations are of this form tau ordering approximately equal to 0.44 times g into epsilon order into f to the power half again this is for the late stage of precipitation where low epsilon ordering is prevails on the other hand for the late uh, stage of precipitation again with the high epsilon ordering okay then what happens then it becomes the equation becomes tau ordering approximately equal to 0.44 g times epsilon order into f to the power minus half minus 0.92 f note that during the later stages of precipitation particle size does not come into play only epsilon order and the precipitate volume fraction impact the strength so this is the information this two empirical relation gives okay as the late stage of precipitation that means during the after the coarsening the particles becomes a little coarser then the size does not matter but epsilon order epsilon order you know the lattice parameter mismatch and the precipitation volume fraction will have huge impact on the strength further a yes, saturation in the strength is predicted order hardening is important in uh, strengthening of certain nickel based superalloys used in high temperature and in some precipitation hardened stainless steels all these expressions uh, shown here they are all uh, you know worked very well in these alloy systems like nickel based superalloy systems and some of these stainless steel uh, stainless steel precipitation hardened systems these expressions worked out or it predicted the strength pretty well so if you look at the uh, in, uh, in in general uh, we have now discussed several strengthening mechanisms this is a uh, uh, critical stress tau for tau c means cutting when the dislocation cutting the through the particle that stress versus the diameter what you are seeing here is uh, the stress required for the dislocation to shear precipitate as a function of precipitate size so so what does it show the stress increases approximately with r to the power half at small r as long as r is small it is strength uh, stress is you know approximately increases with r to the power half however for a fixed particle volume fraction this stress may decrease at larger values of r owing to an increase in particle spacing see this clearly illustrates the importance of different parameters which is associated with the particle hardening not just particle size it is a particle spacing as well as the other energy concentration you have to remember it is not that simple we are going to illustrate those parameters in a, a minute so the overall level of tau c r curve is raised by increases in the either inherent particle strength or particle volume fraction so this direction simply indicates either the volume fraction should be increased or the particle should become hard so these are the two aspects which is going to increase the tau c that means the these two parameters volume fraction and the hard particles especially at the early stage they are going to contribute significantly to the strength other than the uh, rest of the parameters now we turn our attention to non deforming particles so far we looked at uh, you know deform particles we now look at the non deforming particles so for that we look at this uh, yeah, popular uh, schematic which is uh, given in most of the text all of you must have seen so this is uh, a two particle which is you know separated by the distance l 
and each particle having the radius r and the dislocation line is just approaching this and uh, the distance between the inner, inner distance I would say this is uh, center to center distance is L the interparticle distance is L minus 2 R the dislocation is approaching and it is not going to you know cut this cut this particle because they are all non-deformable so it is trying to form a loop and then it uh, loop is formed and then it moves further like similar mechanisms what we have seen in the front feed source type of thing okay but now what you are now seeing the interparticle distance l minus 2r become l minus 2r prime okay the distance is coming down so what are the implications of this kind of uh, system the dislocation bows around the particle that means phi c is equal to 0 the stress required to effect the bypassing is inversely proportional to the interparticle spacing l minus 2 r where r is the slip plane particle radius dislocation loops encircle the particles after the bypass operation a subsequent dislocation would have to be extruded between these loops okay thus the effective particle spacing for the second dislocation is reduced to l minus 2 r prime and the bypassing excuse me and the bypassing stress for this dislocation will be greater than the first one you see this is very important point you have to remember the dislocation line comes and it forms a loop around the particle and then it moves away so the interparticle distance comes down further to l minus 2 r prime so this going to increase the stress for the dislocation which is going to come after this the second dislocation which is going to encounter this the looped particles they are going to experience significantly higher stress to interact so what is that this plot shows this is tau b tau b is shear stress required to bow around the particle for the dislocation as a function of r so it is called bowing stress particle size relationship for a fixed particle volume fraction tau b decreases with increasing r as this is accompanied by an increase in particle spacing okay so increasing f increases the level of the stress as a result of a finer particle spacing okay the level of tau b is unaffected by particle strength that is once a particle is strong enough to resist cutting any further increase in its resistance to dislocation penetration has no effect on tau b which depends only on the matrix properties and the effective particle spacing this is again very very important point as long as the particle strength is concerned so the increase in the shear strength associated with the dislocation bowing is determined from the equation shown previously several equations we have talked about and this we simply replace this l by l by l by l minus 2 r okay we are replacing l by l minus 2 r where the mean spacing between particles is replaced by this to account for the finite particle sizes for a fixed volume fraction of particles l increases concurrently with r that is l minus 2 r increases as the dispersion becomes coarser and thus tau b is greatest for the finer or fine dispersion and this was shown uh, in the figure what we have just seen where tau b is uh, plotted versus r for the two different values of f as indicated by the equation particle strength per se does not influence tau b 
that is once a particle is hard enough that is bobbing rather than cutting is the slip mechanism okay further increases in resistance of particle to dislocation penetration do not affect tau d okay so the moment you see that particle is hard bobbing is the slip mechanism okay rather than cutting that is the message on the other hand the maximum possible particle hardening is frequently related to the particle strength for this dictates both particle size and the stress at which the transition from <coughs> excuse me transition from dislocation cutting to bowing occurs this is another important point we are going to look at now so when we look at the maximum possible particle hardening which is uh, related to the strength of the particle and it is not just strength of the particle both particle size and the stress at which the transition from dislocation cutting to bobbing so we are now talking about the transition from dislocation cutting to bobbing occurs so how this transition is realized this is what we are going to look at now the transition from cutting to bobbing and the maximum particle hardening we are going to have a, a figure which is go, which is going to be like this basically it's a very clumsy figure to start with but uh, we will go through one by one the figure illustrates the interaction among the particle size volume fraction and strength for the cutting and bobbing processes what is what is this figure shows this is tau versus r and another description for this figure is the competition between cutting and bobbing is schematized in the tau r curves okay let us now go through one by one what is curve a curve a is showing tau c that is cutting stress for uh, particle a tau c is uh, for a particle a with the volume fraction f1 so the tau c varies with respect to r like this that is a what is b b is again tau c for a particle b with a similar volume fraction like a that goes like this this is a cutting stress versus r for the b that means b is much harder than the a that's what you are seeing this so what is c c again cutting stress against uh, r for particle a but this is for a different volume fraction the volume fraction is f2 now which is greater than f1 okay so interesting and d is the tau b bowing stress okay bowing stress for a volume fraction f1 and uh, e is a tau b variation with respect to r for the particle of volume fraction f2 where f2 is greater than f1 so it, it is quite interesting plot in fact if you look at very carefully so now what are all the critical parameters we have to look at we will we'll see one by one if particles of a of volume fraction f1 are dispersed in a matrix particles are sheared for r is less than rc1 and are bypassed for r is greater than rc1 so what does it mean we are now talking about <coughs> particle a so this is uh, cutting stress going up to this and then here it you know intersects with the curve d okay so that particular point the intersection point the r is rc1 
So it is as long as the particle radius is r less than this rc1, this particle A is going to get sheared. The moment the radius becomes greater than this rc1, then it is going to bypass. So this is uh, cutting up to this rc1 and then after that it is bypassing. The maximum strength is obtained at R is equal to RC1, where the cutting and the bobbing stress are equal. So at this particular point, RC1, the stress required to cut and bypass the particle are equal. Okay, So this is quite uh, interesting discussion. If inherently harder particle of B of the same volume fraction are present, the level of the tau c curve is increased but that of the tau b one is not so what does it say we are now talking about b okay so the strength is increased for only cutting tau c is increased but tau b is not increased tau b is not increased The maximum hardening greater than that of uh, for A particles is found at RC2 is less than RC1. So this is a maximum hardening uh, for the uh, which is greater than the particle A. We are talking about particle B which occurs at RC2 which is less than RC1. This is RC1, this is RC2. Increasing the volume fraction of A raises the level of both tau B and tau C and increases the maximum strength obtained. So now A volume fraction is increased in the C curve. So we are talking about this point. The maximum strength is also increased and tau B and tau C is also increased. So the increasing the volume fraction of the particles gives uh, most you know possible or maximum particle hardening effect okay uh, is yeah, I mean it is uh, perceived okay the latter is found at tau rc3 so this is tau rc3 which may be either less than or greater than tau c1 uh, uh, yeah, this could be uh, greater than or uh, uh, tau c1, yes, depending upon the shape of the tau c r curve. So this could be, um, so each tau c curve uh, has a different shape. So depending upon the shape, this uh, the tau values also is going to be different. So by looking at all this interaction uh, curve, what you are realizing is the, the tau r curve just keep on increasing. It reaches a maximum point and it comes down. Okay, And this kind of behavior mostly observed in, I mean, are commonly observed in most of the precipitation hardened systems. Okay. But there are some systems which exhibits a initial increase in the tau and then it shows a plateau and then it decreases. That is also people have found and reported. Okay. But in general, this kind of reaching maximum and it is coming down is normally supported by most of the precipitation hardened alloys. There are some systems where you are going to see the, you know, the maximum, the tau c is maximum that occurs still in the shearing of the particle rather than the intersection of the bowing stress. In the previous system, the 
the maximum was found in the intersection of the tau b and tau c but some of the uh, materials exhibits this kind of behavior that is if the intersection of the cutting and bobbing process occurs at a particle size greater than that at which tau c is the maximum maximum strength is obtained while the particles are still being sheared so that is what it is so here the maximum strength is obtained for the alloy but still the mechanism is particle sharing this is in contrast to previous data where it is assumed the interaction or intersection of the respective stresses takes place at a stress less than the maximum possible cutting stress so what we have now seen is uh, you know we have looked at quite a bit of mechanisms for the uh, you know strengthening the alloy okay especially the 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 detail the idea about you know particle hardening we looked at you know, different mechanisms and different possibilities and which are all very technologically important uh, you know systems so with this background we will now go to the actual uh, material properties we now start looking at the material properties we look at uh, mechanical testing and then how the each material behave now we have enough background to look at the mechanical property whatever the you know uh, material system could be now we have the enough background to look at the mechanical data and then interpret them based on the knowledge we have acquired so far so we'll stop here and then we'll start from the uh, mechanical testing in the next lecture thank you